this video, we're going to talk about our tendency to be attracted to the wrong people. Why do I say this is the biggest challenge of all? Well, first of all, my experience, but also I recently sent out a survey to the people who follow the crappy childhood fairy blog. Maybe you saw it. And I mentioned I was working on this new course on dating and relationships. And my survey asked, what topics should I be sure to cover? And a whole bunch of people filled it out and they told me about 20 things that they'd like to see in the course. And some of the topics were pretty low on the list with just one or two people suggesting it. But there was one topic that virtually everyone said was important to them. And that is the problem of our attraction to unavailable people. So here's the question. Why do we do that? What is it about early trauma that predisposes us to all this behavior? And I'll tell you flat out, I don't know. I don't know why. It could be different for different people, but I'll share a few theories that are floating around. One is the one I mentioned earlier when I talked about intermittent reinforcement. It's possible that the flawed parenting we received predisposes us. Okay, so that's certainly possible. That could be happening. The second one is some people think we actually want to recreate the pain of our childhoods so that we can experience winning the love of, of an unloving person. And I know a lot of people resonate and accept that answer, but personally, I think it intellectualizes something and it doesn't hold up. Even if there's a little of that desire to win the love this time thing going on, I think it's far outweighed by a desire to just have a freaking partner. I think something else is going on there. So a third theory that's out there. Some people say childhood PTSD causes so much disconnection that any connection with another person can hijack our whole central nervous system. And I think this explains some of it. And when we're coming from such a needy place, maybe only unhealthy people would ever want to have a relationship with us. Or here's another theory. There's an unconscious language of traumatized people, and we tend to be attracted to each other because there's an understanding, except that two traumatized people are likely to ping pong right off of each other right into problems. So could be some of that. Or here's one worth considering. Even when it seems like the other person is the unavailable one, it's really we who are unavailable. And though consciously we crave committed love, unconsciously we're making sure that we don't get dragged into the smothering responsibility of a real relationship by choosing partners who won't be there for us very long. And I do think there's some truth in this. And some people say we're masochists. We just like getting hurt, maybe. And some say we like the thrill of Russian roulette, possibly in some cases. But a more ordinary theory is since our brains tend to go offline at critical moments that are stressful for us, we're just kind of going into relationships blind. The very people who aren't good for us induce stress, which causes our brains to shut down right when we need them most, and we get all bonded before we know what hit us. This also could be partially true. Okay, so I've just given you a bunch of theories about why we get attracted to unavailable people, but are you ready for my grand theory? Okay, this is it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter why we're like this. I mean, think about it. Even if we knew why, it probably wouldn't change anything. All that matters now is that if we wanna have lasting love, we're going to need to create structures that support us in getting where we're trying to go. So what does that look like? You may have very little control over your attractions, that's normal, but you can draw a clear bottom line on the type of person that you will not date. So that's what the end of this video is about. You looked before at the kind of person you really do want to be with, and now I want you to be very clear with yourself about who you cannot date. You're going to have to draw a line, and that's what I did when I decided that I would never again date anyone who had any kind of drug or alcohol problem. It had happened twice to me that the person I was dating I thought didn't use drugs and then learned there was a major problem way after my life was involved in their life. The first time that I learned that I was dating an addict a long time ago, the guy died of an accidental overdose and it was horrible. 
Then almost 10 years later, I was again shocked to discover that someone I was dating had a serious drug problem, and he also died. It was so horrible for everyone. And for me, it was this terrible realization that while I had no idea how I kept getting into this situation, I had better figure it out or I was in for one really unhappy life. I had a lot of internal obstacles and they were hard for me to recognize in myself, but you'll notice that just about everything in this course is based on those obstacles that I discovered were driving me and the decisions I made to make the problem stop. You don't have to understand the problem or what caused it. You just have to make it stop. So when I drew a line and decided I would never again date somebody with a drug or alcohol problem, I wrote this down just as I'm gonna have you write your lines down in your workbook in a moment. I was really, really specific about what that meant. I would not date anyone who drank alcohol more than a few times a week, or to the point of drunkenness, or whoever used illegal drugs. And I would know this because I'd lay my feelings about drugs and alcohol right out there on the table, on or before the third date. I also decided I would not date anyone who was not open to marriage and in my case, raising the kids I already had. And I would know this because I'd express my interest in marriage and mention the kids before the first date and confirm that this was not a problem for the other person on or before the third date. Now, if this sounds really clinical and controlling, it's not. It was actually something that I could express very gracefully once I knew where I stood. And I remember really well having this conversation over coffee with the man who is now my husband. And I said, are you open to marriage? And he said, I am. And I said, just in case that's where things go for us, are you open to being a step parent to my kids? And he said, just really simply, yes, I am. And we had that out of the way and we could proceed with more dates. A healthy, emotionally available person thinks well of someone who speaks her priorities and gives them a chance to see if their own goals are compatible. That's an attractive thing. And people who think it's weird are probably not good for dating. So right now, I'd like you to open your workbook and complete the self-assessment about negatives, the specific kinds of people you're ready to not date ever again. Yay, not gonna date them anymore. And that way, they can't make you sad and lonely. And they can't fill up that special place right at your side where a good partner will someday stand just loving the crap out of you.